It's the end of the day at Horneman Primary School in Lewisham, South East London. While some of the children have left for the day, up to 80% of them are taking part in one of the after-school clubs. Like many other schools, Horneham and Primary offers a range of after-school activities to their pupils. Right over. Everything from arts clubs to football clubs. But one of their clubs takes advantage of the facilities available at their local museum, the Horneman. It's a fantastic resource having the museum on our doorstep and we've looked at the possibility of using the museum for a club a few years ago and then about two years ago the funding became available and we started working with the museum. The museum club is an after school club run at the museum and sometimes at the school. It's one hour uh, for ten weeks in term time and the staff at the museum and the teachers and the TAs work together to create a really fun programme of activity for the children after school in a really safe and informal learning environment. This type of club is something any school could set up in conjunction with its local museum, gallery or even a zoo. The museum is over 100 years old and is visited by nearly half a million people every year, including pupils from the Horneman Primary School. The children have access to all the museum has on offer, from the exhibitions, through to the staff. This is the Horneman Walrus and everyone knows him and everyone loves him because he's, he's really big. And visiting experts. Yeah, a bit big for you, isn't it? Sir, I'm gonna let you... Joanna Abbott, a teaching assistant at Horneman Primary, runs the club on behalf of the school. I try and make it as much fun as possible. You know, when I was a kid, sort of museums tended to be a little bit, it seems you used to think of them slightly dull and dusty. Um, so you want the children to really um, enjoy them and uh, discover things in there and just have fun. When I first heard about Museum Club, you get the impression that it's going to be really boring because yeah. the museum doesn't exactly sound that interesting. Yeah, but when you really stop going fun. for a few weeks, you get really into it. After a quick refreshment break... Ooh, yummy, yummy in my tummy. It's on with the planned activity for today. A visit to the aquarium. But this visit is more than just looking at the fish. They're planning on using the fishy facts around the aquarium as a basis for a quiz. Um, can can you jellyfish survive in polluted water? Why do fish spit out the worms that they eat? Top one. That way. What's it? That one. Yeah, that so, one. Yeah. That one and that one. Are moon jellyfish stings strong or mild? Do toads protect themselves? Do squirrels and fish that swim together as a shell? Yeah. Describe them. That can be your question. I think the children get the opportunity to be in an informal learning setting and have fun and do really creative activities with their peers. 30 minutes later, and armed with tricky questions, it's back upstairs for the fishy challenge to take place. Can jellyfish survive in polluted water? Um, they can. What do anemones do to clownfish? Ding them. Yeah. <laughs> um, does it, like, um, provide it with a home? No. Oh, protect them. What three colours are the dying poison frog? Red, blue and yellow. I think the questions were pretty tricky, actually, but it's um, not even my fault because I said don't make them too easy. <laughs> How many types of freshwater fish are there in the UK? Is the answer 50? Well done. What gender of seahorse give, give birth? Male. Male. Yeah. The museum club also gets the chance to meet those people who know all about the exhibits on show, the curators. My name's Paolo, OK? I'm a uh, curator here, and I'm a curator of natural history. So... Because the museum is often galleries, you don't always get to see the people 
who look after the objects or who look after the fish in the aquarium and um, it just brings it all to life, also an opportunity to physically go behind the scenes and to ask lots of questions. There are millions of different sorts of animal in the world and trying to put them together in a way that you can kind of understand where they all fit together is quite difficult. Here at the Horniman, there are thousands of different animals on show. All of the animals which are really simple, like really, really simple, like jellyfish and sponges and things like that, are all up there. So you've got crabs, and there's some really cool crabs up there. They're these big rubber crabs, and they eat coconuts. They climb up trees and they cut coconuts down, and they're huge. They're like that big, massive. And you've got lots of different sorts of looking things, which are all the same species. So you can see that you've got the skulls and you've got the heads, and they're a little bit creepy and they're a little bit ugly, but they're kind of cool. Even though the museum has exotic animals from around the world, sometimes the children want to see something from a little closer to home. Do you have any stuffed sheep? Um, we've got a sheep's skull and we've got a section through his head, but we don't have a whole stuffed sheep, I don't think, oh, um, okay. I'm afraid. We want to encourage a passion for museums and for objects and for other world cultures and uh, respect. This is the Horniman Walrus and everyone knows him and everyone loves him because he's, he's really big and he's not quite right but he's lovely anyway. Do you think walruses are really this big? In the, no? Yes. Yeah. Well, they're kind of this big but not quite so fat. You can see all of these lines around here. You see those? Little faint lines. Well, those should all be big wrinkles, big folds in his skin. but. The person who stuffed him, stuffed him too much and made him all blow out. These people are the ones with He's the knowledge and experience yeah, and um, often have a story to tell. I mean, of course, they, they, you can read all sorts of things, but to have somebody telling you about experiences they've had, Sorry, and uh, the children love that. It's great. So I'll let you guys go and have a look around, and if you've got any questions now or when you're looking around, feel free to come and ask me, OK? Through the club, the children can also practice skills they've learnt at school by doing activities such as drawing pictures of the specimens on show. And we're, and we're drawing, drawing that sea urchin. Here! I'm drawing a seahorse. Today I'm drawing a cheetah. It's a combination of um, sort of arty, creative activities, literacy, presentation skills, ICT they do as well. So it's a really mixed bag and hopefully really engaging. As well as educational related projects, the Museum Club has taken part in some more adventurous activities. At the end of last term they had a sleepover um, which was very enjoyable and they wrote newspaper articles for it. So we got to do um, treasure shells. Um, it was absolutely horrible. We didn't get to sleep late. We got to wrap one of our group members up as a mummy and it was a competition to see who could um, wrap them the best. And they sleep over in our temporary exhibition gallery which at the moment is music from India and uh, then we watch a night at the museum quite late at night and then it's definitely lights out after that and uh, it's just another way to be here and for it to feel, feel special and um, much more behind the scenes than uh, I think any of them had thought they would get. For the museum, there are many benefits of working with the club. It's the closest thing we have to a children's forum, so we can use the museum clubs to try out ideas. And this means that they're really influencing what we can create for other children just like them. And that's a really sort of significant form of participation for them. Oh, look at all these bees making honey! Bee, Maria, come and see, come and see! The busy beehives are one of the top attractions for visitors to the museum. Peter, a local beekeeper who looks after the hives, is taking part in one of the regular question and answer sessions. Tell the others where it's come from. In the case of this hive here, being a smallish hive, it is probably about or oh, six, seven thousand workers that leave on this hive, but nevertheless, it's quite a big, big amount of bees. 
Having an expert on hand is the ideal opportunity to find out much more than you can from a textbook. Where does the bees go out to? Like whereabouts? In the... Well, the bee will go up to about a mile and a half normally, and it will go anywhere in, the, in this area. Uh, they'll go looking for honey, and when they find it, they'll come back and they do a little dance, a uh, little circular dance to tell the others where it's come from. Why is it that um, bees die when they sting you and wasps don't? Ah, yeah, well, this bee has a, a barb on the sting. You know a barb you have on a fishing hook? The skin on, on an insect is like your fingernail, but very, very thin, and that is the exoskeleton, as it's called. When a bee, bee stings a, another insect, whether it's a bee, wasp, or whatever it is, that, that uh, chitin, as it's called, will split open and the bee can spin around and find the entrance and then withdraw draw it. But with mammals, which include people of course, um, they put the sting in and it closes over and there's no, no split in it, so they can't pull it out. So they pull and pull and pull, and eventually they pull, pull their, all their sting mechanism out their stomach and so it more or less uh, they die, die with, just with that injury. It's also a chance to pick up some handy hints and tips. If ever a bee comes flying round you, don't try to brush it away, because that's the first thing you can do. It looks on that as an attacking move, and it will get stung. Uh, if you just leave them and they'll fly away again, mind their own, minding their own business and you're minding yours and no one gets hurt. We have such a good relationship with the museum that we're able to... There's a hands-on base where they're able to get things out, try things on. Who wants to try that on? Right, right away round, all on your own. Yeah, that's it. You got it. But the best thing about being a beekeeper Sorry? is all that lovely runny honey. Mmm. Oh, oh, someone fell on me. Mm. That is delicious. I'm collecting things that are dripping to better. Mm. Stick it out. <laughs> that is and every week you just do sort of different stuff, but like, so it's kind of like a surprise. We have a bee expert at the museum and he's been talking to the children. They get to meet the aquarium team, the gardens team. Um, we have one brilliant activity called Crash Test Eggs, which is where they learn about various packing materials that our conservation team use to wrap our, some of our very precious objects and they uh, chuck eggs down from inside Gallery Square onto the floor and see which works best. I think the Museum Club fits in really well and from the observations we've done of the different clubs, the children are getting a very high quality of learning. The Museum Club support the Every Child Matters really well because it's about being healthy and safe and um, sort of enjoyment and achievement as well. They feel like they have the fun and excitement of having a behind the scenes glimpse at the museum, but also they're really positive role models as well. And I mean, hopefully some of those children will go on to think that museums are quite cool places to work as well. You never know. <laughs>